Welcome to this Wednesday, November 16th edition of CT Pulse on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski with Josh Fisher. Hi, Kate. Josh, we have a lot to talk about. I mean, Election Day was last week, but there's still uh, we're still all kind of reeling from it a bit. Yeah, we, we are, and uh, we're looking at a state of Connecticut that had a little bit of a different blue and red footprint than it did in past elections. We'll be talking about that today. Doug Smith, our cartoonist, of course, is going to join us and maybe add some levity uh to to the past week uh but first we are going to be joined by uh kevin reddy yes a return caller uh kevin reddy he's a columnist he's also a former republican state legislator and a blogger at dailyructions.com kevin so happy to have you back on thanks for joining us you're welcome thank you for inviting me now kevin we just want to start out by asking what was your reaction to last week's presidential results and so far president-elect donald trump I was very surprised on Tuesday night when it seemed that Hillary Clinton was stuck far behind uh, Donald Trump on electoral votes. From it didn't seem like hours. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. She was stuck at uh, in the one eighties and then stuck at I think two fourteen for a very long time. And um, it uh, uh, wasn't changing very quickly. And and it seemed to me that the commentators on, and the news people on television were uh knew what was happening and just couldn't bring themselves to say it mm -hmm. so they were all right. holding out on there projecting what states were going in most cases to donald trump mm -hmm. uh i think that wisconsin and uh, pennsylvania were were there uh, and michigan were the biggest prizes for them i had said months ago that if donald trump managed to uh managed to take pennsylvania there would be a lot of fainting on uh, television news programs on election night, and I think they were really surprised. I was, I was certainly surprised. Although, I did predict that a lying, greedy New Yorker would be elected president of the United States. <laughs> <I was correct. laughs> so you got that part right. I mean, Kevin, I just want, were you a never Trump Republican or, or what was your I take am, on that? I am yeah. a never Trump Republican and I am not backing down from that. Good for you. I know what I believe and I know what he believes and they are not the same things. Now, Kevin, what has your response been so far to some of the transition that's been happening uh, with Trump's team so far? Um, I, it's hard to know if it's as chaotic as reports, right. uh, as reports indicate. I wouldn't be surprised that I don't, it's not a it doesn't seem like it's a very disciplined operation just from the nature of how Donald Trump conducts himself. And, uh, you know, the, the guy at the top is some reflection of what's going on in other places in an organization. I, uh, I think it's good that Chris Christie has been unceremoniously banished from the transition. Uh, I do think that's uh, a step in the right direction. I, I guess I'm, I'm mildly uh, assured that Mike Pence has taken over because he, he does seem... Uh, mature and he's he, you know, he's governor of uh, he is governor of Indiana and he was in the uh, in Congress so I think he at least is fami quite familiar with the levers of government and how these things work and right. that's good right. and um, and I also think that um, Chris Christie is is forever stained by these uh, convictions in the Bridgegate trials right yeah. So, um, moving to uh, to Connecticut, Kevin, uh, it was, uh, while well, Hillary Clinton won the state, it was a really good night for Connecticut Republicans who picked up uh, three seats in the state Senate and eight seats, it looks like, in the House. I know there's still uh, a couple recounts going on in Democratic-held districts. Um, what do you attribute uh, that to? Well, the first thing to note is that there were a tremendous number of ticket splitters around the state, mm -hmm. which is a good sign. That suggests that, that people are paying uh, close attention to what's going on. Sometimes in presidential elections, you do get voters who are more interested in the presidential race and not that familiar with lower ballot candidates right. because they don't get nearly as much attention as the presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. And they often just vote for the, for the uh, a straight ticket of uh, the presidential candidate they favor, which in Connecticut is almost always a Democrat now. Mm. So the, the, 
by the Republicans winning these seats, and in many, you know, in some of these instances, running very far ahead of Donald Trump. Uh, it shows that that the public is engaged. They understand what is a growing crisis in state finances and the state economy, and they acted to to uh, to bring about some change. The first the first step uh, in um, uh, in doing that this year was to change the legislature. So they changed the state senate. Uh, eighteen to eighteen. It really means that there has to be a comprehensive power sharing agreement between the Republicans and the Democrats. And those added numbers in the uh, state house, we can't be sure because the Republican leader, Themis Claritas, is so close to the Democratic leader, uh, Joe Harris, similar to that. That you know, he may uh, he may very well have a hundred and fifty one seat majority with the way she operates. But in the Senate, I think you can count on more of a Republicans asserting themselves. Now, what do you think of uh, Democrats recently saying that a lot of that success by Republicans last week in Connecticut was due to uh, an influx of outside money? Oh, they're, well, uh, they're, you know, they're always quick to blame people exercising their free speech rights. It's, it's very disturbing that in the Constitution state, these people who, who really should know better and should be protecting our constitutional rights rather than assaulting them um, would blame the right of others to exercise their, their free speech. And uh, people do it all the time. Unions do it all the time for Democrats. But they don't like it when the playing field grows a little more level. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, they don't blame the fact that they've gone along with Dan Malloy for six years. Uh, with two enormous, one the largest, the other the second largest tax increases in Connecticut history, and people know it. Yeah. They, they know it. The Democrats had plenty of money. It's just the Republicans this time also had money to shine a light on on, uh, on individual votes. They also, and they, did, they never liked to acknowledge this, but the Republicans had recruited some very good candidates, uh, especially for the state Senate. George Logan in uh, from in this district that runs in the Naugatuck Valley over to Hamden was a a energetic, art, uh, articulate, uh, and uh, smart candidate, and he was running against uh, an eighty some odd year old incumbent who'd been yeah. in their office for twenty uh, some odd years, wow. and um, uh, the voters could see the difference. Yeah, Logan was able to uh, to defeat Joe Crisco uh, of Woodbridge, and that was uh, one of the few uh, races that you could cut. You saw that the voters that who voted for Trump also voted for a Republican in those districts. Many of the other uh, towns that went with Trump also crossed their ticket party lines and stuck with the Democrats who'd been uh, who'd been uh, in office there for a long time. Just mm-hmm. like a lot of the Clinton voters down here yeah. in our little corner of the state in Fairfield County. Yeah. Uh, stuck with their Republican state legislators. Right. I mean, Darien, would, the only town in Fairfield County that voted for Goldwater back in uh, 64, actually voted for uh, Clinton this time. Um, oh, yes. I mean, I think if you look at, at Western or Wilton, uh, Donald Trump got under 30% of the vote, and, of course, the Republican legislators did, did really well there. Right, yeah. So that's Very people paying attention yeah, yeah. to... Their their ballot and understanding the value of each vote. So it seemed like in the you know the kind of the wealthier suburbs, which are down here in Fairfield County, that have been traditionally Republican, um, they decided that Trump wasn't their type of Republican and went with Clinton. And in the more working class uh, suburbs in the center of the state uh, that have traditionally been Democrat, they decided that Clinton wasn't their type of Democrat, or that Trump was actually speaking um, their language and went with him. Um, uh, what is it? Something that I, it was uh, 42 towns in the middle of the state flipped from uh, yeah. Obama in 2012 to Trump in 2016. Have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, that that is, you know, when you think of the vast differences between them, uh, it is. It, it, you look across the country, the number of counties where uh, Barack Obama won in 2008, 2012, and and uh, uh, Donald Trump took those same places. This year, you think, well, that's that. That's a lot of people. That that is pr- millions of people who voted for Obama in two other elections, voting for Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And you think 
Boy, that's a real case study <laughs> as <laughs> to well how each each person travels that road. Mm-hmm. You just you wouldn't. Uh, it, it's not what we would expect. Right. When we had you on. Um, uh, before the election, Kevin, we I, I, we uh, we talked about who was more unpopular in Connecticut, uh, Donald Trump or Dan Malloy, um, and uh, now we know. Now, now we, we know, know for now. sure. Don't we? Don't we? You're going to tell me I doubt. was right. You're right to do it. You're right and, to say it, it, it Josh. It really, <laughs> it really is. It, it, but though uh, this week, Dan Malloy is who is about to enter his seventh year as governor come January is blaming um, Rell, Roland, and uh, possibly even Weicker for the state budget woes uh, that we, we continue to have. Uh, how much water does that argument hold? None. <laughs> and uh, you notice he doesn't, that's not what he, that's not the argument he made, he made in 2014 when he was reelected. Right. Everything was great. Yep. It was great. No more, no, no deficits, no tax increases. I don't know if you recall that. But oh, yeah. He promised everything was great. So how could it be? How could it be those three uh, predecessors who right. were responsible for all this yeah. mess uh, when, when he never mentioned it was being reelected? In fact, there was no mess in 2014, according to him. Right. And the Democrats have held control of the state legislature uh, since you know, since Roland was in office, they, they took over. Well, the state they had in, in, the, in the last fifty years, the Republicans have controlled the House and the Senate together for two of those years, and the Senate alone for two other years. Right. That's it in fifty years. So uh, it's five it, zero years. Right. So it's always kind of interesting when the the uh, the, the chief elected official decides to take credit for what's good and then blame uh, his predecessors for when for what's not good when uh, it's this, the General Assembly you could I think always like you could point at Congress for not doing a good job it's easy to point your finger at the General Assembly um, but also as we see a lot of uh, our uh, our residents still do have respect or at least like to vote for their the incumbent uh, the incumbent legislators yes yeah I mean, it wasn't a wholesale rejection no of the legislature, but it was in terms of the kind of ebbs and flows you get in Connecticut, which has become a very, very blue state. It was it was big, and they they understand that at the Capitol. I I think the Democrats are dreading what's ahead because they um, they know that uh, we have at least three billion dollars in deficits in the next two years that that they are responsible for. Addressing because they still have a majority in the House and they they have eighteen in the Senate with uh, you know, on a tie vote the Democratic Lieutenant Governor also gets to vote so people will be looking to them for leadership and um, their instinct is not to is not to is not to make cuts in the budget not not what they think they've been elected for. Now, Kevin, you mentioned recently um, on Daily Ructions, uh, back in 94, you remembered a moment when there was a tie in the state Senate. What was the feeling then? What happened? Oh, the feeling then was, first feeling was, oh, I really, they really hoped I would win my recount. <laughs> That's right. what the first feeling was. But the feeling was that it was going to be have to be a comprehensive uh, power-sharing agreement. Uh, the Democrats were, were very assertive about that for those three days while the while the result was in doubt. Mm. And uh, because the the lieutenant governor does not participate in the forming of the Senate, just doesn't do it, not, not in the room, uh, does not preside, the Secretary of the State presides over that, uh, that part of the session, the first day session of the legislature, and uh, the Secretary of the State does not have a vote. So, so it is... Um, uh, they, they they really need to come to an agreement to divide um, to divide the um, with the uh, leadership uh, right the responsibilities so what do you and expect the committee to assignments and the and most of all and, and I should say, I should say most of all but for the Senate Democrats the budget because now that they don't have a majority they really should be splitting the budget the Senate operating budget in half and mm. they don't want to do that because they the majority party grabs a lot of the money, hmm. and uh, right. they're not they, they're not going to be able to do that, and they're going to have to make changes in their staff. Any predictions? They'll reach an agreement, I think. 
Yeah. I think they'll reach. I think they'll reach a a a an agreement, and um, uh, things will be different. And they will really uh, on on many of the mechanics, they're going to have to cooperate. So you're optimistic. I don't think that they'll reach an agreement on the budget for right. many, many months. Mm -hmm. It should be interesting. So, Kevin, before we let you go, how do you think this, uh, the election results that we saw last week, how is that going to play into 2018? Uh, you know, as an aside, a lot of us who thought, myself included, that Hillary Clinton would win and might take someone like Dan Malloy with her to Washington would have really opened up the governor's race. But now... Uh, Mr. Malloy, the race is open. <laughs> right, but but do you, but do you, do you do you think Malloy runs for a third term? No, no, no. Okay, no, I don't. No. And uh, no. do you think that the Republicans get their act together and nominate somebody who can get statewide uh, support, or does uh, Donald Trump? I think so. I you know I think certainly the public is receptive to it. Yeah. Uh, of course, if Donald Trump has a terrible, terrible first two years. They will be less receptive right. to it, and they, they'll, they'll want to send a message, and not necessarily send a message to Hartford, but send a message mm -hmm. to Washington. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't know if he's going to, if, if, if things that he's terrible at are going to affect people's day-to-day -day life. Right. I don't know if he mm -hmm. slaps 45% tariffs yeah. uh, on goods coming into the United States, then yes, he will do a lot of, econo a lot of economic damage very quickly. Yeah. Well, what's been interesting, too, is so the past uh, few, particularly since Obama took office, midterm elections, we've seen Connecticut do the opposite of what the rest of the country has, has done. It's, yes. you know, and yes. so it'll be, it'd be interesting to see if Connecticut still likes to be different or if we just are that blue of a state and it doesn't matter who's in, who's in the presidency or, or, who's in Washington, or who's up in Hartford, but we're going to still vote for the blue team. Um, or if uh, this is the start of, you know, kind of Malloy having to answer, and will all those people who came out and voted for Trump, um, and still, and the Republicans down here who voted still stuck with their Republican party. Of course, there aren't many Democrats in southwestern Connecticut to vote out outside of you know Norwalk and Stanford. But what will happen in 2018? And and um, that's a really terrible way of me asking you a question. Uh, but what do you well, think about we, that? Well, we haven't had a, Republic, a popular Republican president in office in a long, long right. time to see what would happen if, right. if, if, that, if, that, if we were to have one, what would that effect be on a state election in right. Connecticut? It'd be, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to wonder. Of course, the, what, the last if time we had a popular Republican president, Lowell Weicker became our governor. Well, he, he was sort of, yes, in 1990, though, his popularity was... Well, I guess his popularity was pretty was pretty high in about nineteen. Yeah, Bush's was good then in uh, George H. W. Bush. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You're right. But then but we, we had we had the many state the troubles. Yes, and uh, and there's that's the reason why all of our paychecks are lighter now too. That's one of them. But the spending <laughs> the spending has something to do with it too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. State spending, not your spending. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I make no well. claim to knowledge of your personal <laughs> yeah. Although my, my wife might, uh, might disagree with you on that. Uh. <laughs> well, Kevin, we're going to let you go. Thanks, as always, for joining us. And we recommend everyone check out dailyructions.com. Always entertaining analysis there. Uh, just so appreciate it. I just put up a, a, a pertinent blog post, and there is a wonderful audio clip of a little four-year-old English girl on the phone um, with uh, emergency services saving her mother's life. I just oh, saw wow. that. Check it out. It's so. dailyrections.com. Kevin, thank you so much for talking with us. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. All right. We are going to step out for a break here on CT Pulse. We'll be back with more post-election analysis after this. Have a sports injury or a slip and fall that needs immediate care? Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast, without an appointment. Biking, golf, tennis, soccer, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, open Monday through Saturday, now in two locations. The I Park Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk and 36 Old Kings Highway South in Darien. Or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com, like them on Facebook. As you're getting back to your regular schedules, we're excited to get back to doing what we do best 
offering you the freshest seasonal fare and all the ingredients for a healthy start to school. So shop Walter Stewart's for everything fresh, from A apples to Z zucchini, and from cotton candy grapes to back to nature all natural snack bags. We save you time by stocking all of your favorite back to school essentials under one roof. Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Hi, this is Leo Carl from Carl Chevrolet in New Canaan. And you've heard me talk about the Chevy Volt for years. The new model gets 53 miles on EV charge daily, plus 420 mile full range. But don't take my word for it. You need to come in and test drive the Volt yourself. Visit us at 261 Elm Street in New Canaan or online at carldirect.com. At Hoyt Livery, our goal is to always... Sam, what are you doing? We're filming a commercial. I'm checking out the new Hoyt On The Go app. Hoyt's here! Discover a world of wellness in the heart of New Canaan. Halo Studios, New Canaan's first collaborative wellness center, offers you the freedom to choose from the best and latest health, fitness, and wellness options. Inside Halo Studios, you'll find all the wellness experts you need at places like Halo Fitness, Priority Wellness, and Sama Yoga Center. Come by for a free wellness assessment, open seven days a week at 45 Grove Street. For more information, visit halostudios.com or call 203-594-9909. Give your day a jump start with the latest news, sports, weather, and more on Coffee Break, live on the HAN Network, weekdays at 11 a.m. Connecticut news doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break. If you're watching this broadcast, you're not alone. The HAN Network is available for 200,000 Connecticut cable customers on the Frontier Network. And we've also reached 1.7 million viewers on our free live streaming sports, news, and entertainment broadcasts. To reach our rapidly growing audience, contact Advertising Director Jessica Murren at 203-273-273. 7312 or email jessica at han.network. We're back on this week's edition of CT Pulse on the HAN Network. Kate Chaplinski. Josh Fisher. And Josh, you know, we talked with Kevin about a lot of uh, kind of this post-election analysis. Mm -hmm. I know you were looking at and talking about Clinton winning Connecticut, but Trump making a lot of gains around yeah. the state. So and we showed this map during our talk with, uh, with Mr. Rennie, and this was a uh, put together uh, by the good folks at CT Mirror, who do a great job covering our state capital and what's going on around Connecticut. So it's interesting, and um, what I found interesting, and actually Danbury, which is that um, pink town all the way to the left there, just north of Ridgefield the, uh, in the western corner, that actually did vote for Clinton. Uh, but so you have New Fairfield just north of it, which is the most southwestern town, and Trumbull on the other end the, to vote for Trump which is something, Kate, in our entire lifetime of living in and covering uh, the state of Connecticut, we've never seen a presidential map that looked like this. You'd have to go all the way back to 1964 to see uh, those towns vote for the Democrat, and even Darien in 64 stuck with, uh, or went with Goldwater. Um, and this year, I mean, the Darien, Connecticut, voted for Hillary Clinton is huge. Uh, so, and so in Clinton won Connecticut. She did not do as well as Obama did in 2012. And while Trump lost the state, he then un conversely outperformed Romney, uh, how Romney did in 2012. Ten towns flipped from Romney in 2012 to Clinton in 2016. Seven of those are in Fairfield County. Uh, the other three are um, Avon Granby and East Granby there in, uh, in northern Connecticut that you can see up there. That's the dark blue. Um, but Greenwich, Darien, New Canaan, Wilton, Ridgefield, Easton, and Newtown all flipping to um, to Clinton is kind of mm -hmm. huge yeah. I I think um, well, you know we did predict we didn't predict the presidential race right no. Josh but we did have a feeling that a lot of those Republican right. towns would go for Clinton uh, yeah. and you know we saw in New Canaan where they get a great turnout usually um, in presidential mm -hmm. years it was down slightly it was yeah. still a good turnout uh, but it was down a bit which could mm -hmm. mean that a lot of people weren't yeah. happy with Trump at the top of the turnout ticket. across the state was down compared to mm -hmm. uh, 2008 uh, so that was certainly, you know, interesting because on the other end, you know, so Clinton didn't have the coattails in the traditional Republican towns like we talked with Kevin. 
It was a lot of uh, people voting for Clinton at the top of the ticket or possibly leaving it blank or voting third party, but then sticking with their incumbent legislators, which are you know mostly Republican in those uh, small suburban towns here. Here's where, you know, so you can see this is another map from, or a chart from uh, CT Mir where Clinton outperformed Democrats in Connecticut. Westport, not a surprise, uh, the biggest town, it's, you know, one of the more Democratic towns, but still down ballot only stuck with the Democrat 12% um, uh, fewer votes that way. Um, Wilton, like Kevin Reddy had mentioned, was a, was a big swing. And you could see Darien and Greenwich and Ridgefield, uh, Fairfield, Reading and Easton down here in this lower uh, left-hand corner of the state really uh, showing people split, split, split their vote, which is something that Connecticut has always been yeah. kind of known for. We're not a um, you know, single vote yeah. state. I like to say we have state. an informed electorate. People uh, really pay attention to the candidates. Yes. For the most part, I think. Yes. And that's a good thing. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And so Donald Trump conversely flipped 42 towns, all of them mostly in the middle part of the state. Uh, and here you can see where Trump outperformed uh, the rest of the Republican ticket in Connecticut uh, down ballot wise and you know, some of these are some, some rather small towns, too, in the middle of the state. Sprig, Franklin, Basra, Thompson, Putnam, Killingly, uh, Voluntown, Lisbon, Griswold, Plainfield. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And it certainly, you know, it, it did, <laughs> the Democrats were able to still hold on to some control in Hartford, uh, which is a big deal. But uh, so Obama outperformed Clinton in about 80% of Connecticut's towns. Wow. So of the 169 towns, Obama did better four years ago than Clinton did this year. As we talked about with Kevin, three state Senate seats did flip from Democrat to Republican, created an 18-18 split, which will be fun to watch over the next two years. And Republicans did re uh, reduce the Democrats' advantage in the state house. Uh, coming into currently right now, it's 87 to 64 in favor of the Democrats. It's now going to become January 79 to 72. There are two uh, towns that are still, uh, two districts in the state house where recounts are going on. They're currently Democratic held, and the Democrats do hold an advantage of fewer than 100 votes mm. in both of those. Wow. Um, so, and also the federal candidates did well uh, for the you know the incumbents all got reelected in Connecticut from Blumenthal to all the congressional races. It was the fifth district, which is Northwest Connecticut, where Elizabeth Esty was narrowly reelected by three points, 51 and a half percent to 48.5. That was a few thousand votes. So, um, but completely different map, and it'll be interesting too to see what happens in four years, and also what really happens in two years. Uh, and particularly if uh, Malloy does not run for re-election, which he's so unpopular, but he was so unpopular four years True. ago, and, and people still... people thought he was going to lose. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you could never put it past or put any doubt that the Connecticut Republican Party will fi find a way to screw up an easy election and not win. <laughs> They've been doing it for you know almost for ten years now, mm -hmm. since since. Um, well, since 2008. <laughs> well, Josh, another thing we mentioned uh, with Kevin Rennie was talking about the influx of money uh, that Republicans had during mm -hmm. this campaign season. The Hartford Current did an interesting story. And an interesting piece in that was that in its first major effort to directly impact legislative races, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association laid out a total of uh, over half a million dollars in 14 races. They backed a dozen Republicans and two Democrats who have generally sided with the GOP on budgetary yeah. matters. So, and what's interesting too, and so you know, and like Kevin said, you know, the Democrats call call you know foul play because they didn't, you know, because it's actually people are the Republicans are actually trying to win this year, which is something mm -hmm. the Democrats have had a easy time for the most part for you know a generation of of running things in Hartford and for the most part getting reelected, and you know every now and again some Republicans will make some headway, but then maybe the census comes out and. The districts are moved along, moved a little bit, and everything stays okay. So this is, you know, the the Democratic Party in Connecticut has been put on notice here, and and showing that people pay attention right. to who who is up in Hartford, because like we talked about on this show before times, it's like, yeah, you know, the the presidential race gets all the coverage and all the attention, but really, what happens in Hartford for us in Connecticut is much more important and has a has a bigger impact on your daily life mm -hmm. than what the president does. 100%. Yeah, really interesting there. But speaking of what the president does. Yes, the president-elect does. The does. president-elect does. <laughs> who's actually even technically not the president-elect till the Electoral College votes on December 19th. Oh, but, interesting. Um, Fun fact, I didn't know Yes, that. so he's the presumptive presidential-elect, just like he was the presumptive Republican nominee until he got that official right. last delegate. Okay. Um, or until he won the convention. But... 
whatever. So. Well, we should mention that Connecticut senators uh, joining the many other uh, senators around the nation decrying Trump's appointment of Stephen Bannon. Uh, as his chief strategist. Yes. So for anyone that doesn't know, it's basically that position. Uh, Karl Rove held had that position. David Axelrod had it in the uh, the first term for uh, in Obama's White House. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of uh, issues there. Yeah. I mean, Stephen Bannon, part of Breitbart News, uh, has been backed by white nationalists uh, and members. Well, he's, of he's part of the alt-right movement. And, yes. you know, so, but, I mean, the thing is, is too, is we can't be that surprised that Donald Trump's going to give a really nice position to the guy who helped get him elected president of the United right. States. And the best way to avoid having people like Steve Bannon um, in the White House would be for the Democrats to actually run a good campaign for president and win. Because, uh, you know, if Hillary Clinton had run that campaign better and maybe actually visited Michigan, or she visited Michigan a lot, or, or thought that Pennsylvania was in play, and all, it was a 60,000 vote swing, basically, in those two states that cost Clinton the presidency, because she certainly won the popular vote. The polls were right about that. They, it was the, the smaller votes that, that weren't right. So that's the best way to, to avoid these things. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that you blame the loser more than the winner uh, mm -hmm. in a close race. Fair enough, fair enough. But uh, it is troubling, to say the least. Uh, we're going to have to see what happens with I'll that. Certainly. I mean, I think it's troubling that we're going to have, you know, Donald Trump be our president, mm -hmm. but he did win. Right. And, and he's backed off yeah. some of uh, the rhetoric. Not all. There's still some concerning things he yes. said in his recent interview with Leslie Stahl, I think. Um, right, right. But, uh, you know. But could you imagine, like, what is it like best. when we, you see him up there on the state capitol with John Roberts and, you know, being sworn in and this big orange dude um, is, yeah. you know, it's, but um, he won. He won. And the, you can't wait for that first State of the Union address. I mean, um, yeah. but the thing, you know, and um, Chris Powell had a good column on this this week pointing out how, you know, we, America survived Nixon, uh, who was a crook. Uh, and did all these things. It may have set us back a little bit, but it seems like every time we move forward, we're going to move back to maybe on uh, becoming a more progressive exactly, country. Exactly, right. It seems to be the way that it swings. Yeah, uh, you know, you wonder what's going to happen with the Supreme Court because there's a lot of old uh, justices out up there who tend to lean at least in the middle or, or to the left, so, so that will be interesting. But um, I, don't, I, I understand people's frustration, too, in the... The, the rioting and all that, but also like what like it was a fair election, right? And everyone who said that Donald Trump wasn't going to uh, accept the results, most of those people are now not accepting the results. And uh, at some point, somebody has to actually decide to work with the person who wins an election. Otherwise, right. every four years or every two years, we're just going to be fighting with each other, and nothing's going to happen. And eventually, there has to be a winner. There has to be someone who's a Who's a fair, who's a good winner and someone who's a good loser? Mm -hmm. But this country's full of sore losers and sore winners. Right, and, but I do think to be fair, we're saying this from a position of privilege, and maybe for some of the people that feel uh, that Donald Trump said some very scary things, uh, they might feel very nervous mm -hmm. about what's to come. Right, which I but understand. you could also conversely say that there's some people in Middle America who think that Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama say some scary course, things yeah. about their of jobs, course. and why are we deciding who's more who, who has the right, right to be more scared? Uh, you yeah. know, the rules are what they are. And because of the Electoral College, the middle America gets to have a big say in what happens. And that's something that the Founding Fathers put in way back when to help us create a nation. Without the Electoral College, we might not have the country that we have today just because a lot of the states, the smaller states like the Georgias and the Rhode Islands might not have uh, signed up to be part of this union, uh, mm -hmm. you know, over 200 years ago. But, um, you know, it's also not designed to make everybody happy. I mean, it's democracy. And uh, the best way we could do this is we can hold another vote in two years and then another one uh, two years after that. Yeah. So. All right. All right. Well, in the wake of uh, Trump's election, even though we told everyone to cut it out if they were doing anything like this, uh, there have been some reports around Connecticut of uh, some swastikas spray painted on private property in the past few weeks. Uh, we also had some party goers at a weekend bonfire, one of them dressed in a Ku Klux Klan robe and was waving a Donald Trump campaign flag. Uh, Wilton High School and Joe Barlow's reports, not substantiated, mm -hmm. that kids were yelling out, you know, build the wall. Um, so some interesting results of that election. Um, you know, and, and we're getting reports like that around the country. Yeah, well, I mean, it's more than worse than interesting. It's, it's troubling to see it's any scary. of that. And there's also been reports on the other side of, uh, you know, people getting punched in the face for wearing a Make America Great Again right. hat. And, uh, you know, a lot know, of anger out there. But, and we knew, that the, but the thing is, is like, why are we all surprised at this? Everyone's been lamenting over the past year and a half about what terrible choices we have for president. And we'll, 
one of those terrible choices was elected president. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that people are upset that one of the terrible choices ended up winning. But um, eventually some people, like we said, I said before, you know, we have to learn to be nice and actually, you know, try and work with the winners and not punch them in the face. True. Good as point. As much as some people deserve to get punched in the face. Put. They, <laughs> No, Josh, you were looking at Governor Malloy talking about the next budget. Yes, yes. He said that, you know, he, there's, you know, the costs are surging and there's all these, you know, unprecedented rates, but he's really trying to keep the budget down. Uh, but we're facing another $1.5 billion deficit in the next fiscal year. And uh, the governor is continually, like Kevin Rennie told us earlier today, said that he's not going to raise taxes. And then that's often led to, so far he's broke, he, he set a record for the highest tax increase. Then two years later, he broke that record uh, after saying he wasn't going to raise taxes. So, um, but it'll also be interesting to see how that split Senate works yeah. with the budget. And I think it's in the Republicans' best interest to still, as bad, it was, as bad as it would be for the state, to let the Democrats own whatever this next budget is because it would likely mm. fail and that would really help them actually take control. But the worst part about winning an election is then you have to govern and then you're responsible for what happens. Right. And you know we could be looking at a Connecticut in come 2019 after the 2018 election when um, the Republicans take control of at least the state Senate, if not the state house and the governor's mansion. And then, oh my God, like, how are they going to actually govern? It's all up to, it's them. All up to yeah. them, too. Right. So then, you know, and, and it'd be important, too, for them not to then decide to blame, blame Governor Malloy for mm -hmm. the past problems, because Governor Malloy, they've all said that that's not right for him to blame, uh, you know, Rel and Roland uh, yeah. before him. Of course, they all say that. <laughs> right. You know, Obama blamed Bush, from the Bush blamed Clinton. Yeah. 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 So Trump's going to blame Obama, and, uh, you know, we're still going to be stuck in this mess that is America Help. come two years or four years from now. <laughs> all right, Josh. Well, we are going to take a break. Go on to something much lighter when we come back. Doug Smith joins us for some drawing conclusions after this. Connecticut is coming back to hometown banking to a partner that makes small businesses feel big. Where community comes first. Where high-tech tools go hand in hand with a human touch. Where you get the know-how only neighbors can deliver. Where saving time is important too. It's time to expect more. It's time to bank well. Bank smart. Bank local. Bank well. I really wanted something that felt like a home. Coming from a big house, I wanted the feel of a home as opposed to a condo. My property taxes on my single family home were close to $20,000 a year. Now that I've downsized and I'm in a town home, and because of the condo tax laws, my fees have gone from $20,000 down to about $5,300 with the star exemption. There is no other town home that compares in the area. This is where I want to be. At Whip Blow Dry Bar and Salon of Ridgefield, it's all about creating a hassle-free, high-end experience for the entire family. Open seven days a week, the makeup and hairstyle salon on Governor Street has it all. From color services, men's haircuts with a complimentary microbrew, affordable kids' cuts, and more. And our blowout package includes a shampoo, scalp massage, blowout of your choice, and a lipstick application done by a celebrity makeup artist. Download the Whip Salon app to view the styles and book appointments. Get more information at whipsalon.com, 203-442-6. 444 or find WHIP on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On time, done right, safe, and reliable. Mr. Handyman Let our satisfied customers tell it. I have called Mr. Handyman for every reason, every occasion, every broken item, every leak. They have bailed me out on many occasions, and I would recommend them to anyone. For any project, large or small. Mr. Handyman CD. For unique and special holiday gifts, come to Touch of Sedona, a spiritual boutique located in the heart of Ridgefield, Connecticut. We have plenty of unique pieces, including Native American and equestrian jewelry, crystals, candles, incense, and books, as well as an ever-changing showcase of artists, intuitive practitioners, healers, and lots more. Happy Holidays from Touch of Sedona, 452 Main Street in Ridgefield. Visit us today. Open seven days a week. I'm Frank Granito. And I'm Donald Ng for the HAN Network. 
Tune in to Nutmeg Sports Monday through Thursday, where we bring you all the top stories from Connecticut sports. From highlights to player interviews and expert analysis, no one gets you closer to Connecticut's games than Nutmeg Sports. Nutmeg Sports, now Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. on the HAN Network. All right, the true tragedy of this Shakespearean play is the actor playing Juliet, Doug I know. Smith. Oh. Look at, like, you're about to tumble down. I know, I know. It was a packed house, too. Unfortunately, the packed house came with torches and pitchforks. And, and uh, you don't look very interested in what <laughs> Romeo's Althar. about to say to you. We're but. far out far. <laughs> All right, Doug. Well, let's get into this week's cartoons. Of course, some fall humor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Leave me alone after he raked that nice pile. That's they just won't go away, those leaves. I know. <laughs> All right, I like this one too. Monroe Police Canine Murphy received a new vest. It's an LL Bean vest. It's lovely. I know. Actually, it should be an Orvis vest if it's a dog. <laughs> yeah, <is>. right. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now tell us about this one a little bit. Oh, this is just uh, after the election, and you know they were talking about the millennials getting upset, and uh, you know the thing. The millennials now have their safe places. Uh, so it was just a play in words. It's my safe place is definitely a bar. I think that I still yeah. qualify as a millennial, Josh. Yeah, I, yes, I thought, I thought this was me. your safe place, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I run to the bar after this same place. All right, the Golden Eagle marching yep. band. This is in Trumbull. They're hoping right. to march. In, in the, the inaugural, inaugural parade. parade. And that's and Trump's then, response, uh, that yep. it's a Trumbull band. That's Maybe really, they'll really, make it because yeah, of that. It's a Trumbull band. It's yeah. really, really great. Maybe <laughs> Tim Herbst could change the name of the town to Trumbull. There you go. Ah. <laughs> All right, now I also like this humor. Uh, and Milford, the lamplight stroll. <laughs> Lamplight Troll. Very nice. Yep. And I love this one too. Devil's Den closing for deer hunts. I'll bag, I'll see some horns, I'll bag them. That's the devil's home. He went in, it's his den. <laughs> Very sad. <laughs> He's killed all evil in the world. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Doug, well, as always, thank you for making okay. us laugh. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. No, we won't see you next week. We'll That's see you in right. a couple weeks. Have a happy Good Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yes, have you a too. great Thanksgiving. Thanks, Doug. All right, we are going to wrap things up here on CT Pulse. Josh, no CT Pulse next Wednesday because we're going to be out on the road getting ready for Turkey Bowl. Yes, yes. we'll be super excited. So we'll, we'll have a little bit of politics involved uh, in our massive coverage next Wednesday, which will be from 11 to 1 uh, live here, and plus a special Nutmeg Sports all on the road as we get ready for Darien versus New Canaan. Only place to watch it if you can't get one of those scarce tickets is right here on the HAN Network on Thursday morning. That's awesome. All right, well, we'll see you later. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>